Today's guest is legendary human rights attorney, professor of law, Noura Arakat. Welcome to the Palestine Pod. Law is a tool to be employed strategically in the service of a political movement. What I've mapped out between 1917 and 2017 is how the relationship between law and power has shaped the Palestinian struggle for freedom. International law has been far more advantageous to its settler colonial project than it has to Palestinians. Other periods, law was used to Palestinian advantage, guerrilla Diplomacy. They weren't there to be polite. International law was developed in the crucible of imperial expansion in order to facilitate imperial conquest. These powers were reshaping the law. These are systems that aren't particular to geography. I draw parallels. Bantu stands are developed in the image of reservation in Canada. Killing black people, transgender people, children, men, women in the United States is extrajudicial execution as well. Acknowledge this is not just police brutality. These are colonial practices. Hello and welcome to episode 56 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where we break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine from all over the world and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of supporting the Palestinian struggle for justice and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Laura E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gazan Girl, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mikey B. What's up, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok, Michael Scherzer on Instagram, and you can call me Mikey Intifada if you could take time off from attacking funeral processions to call college kids anti-Semitic. Before we get into today's episode, please like, comment, and subscribe if you hang out with us on YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast app, subscribe and leave a review. As always, you can find our full episodes and sources on palestinepod.com. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com and give us a follow on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. We're also going strong on Patreon, so if you love the Palestine Pod and you want to support this project, join our Patreon where you get early access to the Palestine Pod episodes, an additional podcast per week called the Patreon Pod. You also get access to our Palestine Pod book club, hosting our monthly Zoom happy hours with our Patreon subscribers only. So really exciting stuff. Check us out on patreon.com slash Palestine Pod. Today's guest is quite frankly legendary and needs no introduction. To cover her highlights, she's a scholar, human rights attorney, professor of law, prolific author, thinker, and activist. In 2019, she published The Enlightening Justice for Some, Law and the Question for Palestine. Professor Noura Arakat, welcome to the Palestine Pod. I thank you, and thank you for that embarrassing and very humbling introduction. Thank but necessary. Having. Didn't even cover all of your accolades, truly. We could have kept no. going, but we're sparse for time. I appreciate that because I might have jumped off. <laughs> I'm excited to be here with you. So let's jump right into the book. It's probably, in terms of my library, the single most marked up book that I have. As, as an international lawyer myself, it, it changed and challenged my own view of the field. And I learned so much from the book and we're super grateful to be able to be in discussion with you today about it. Lara, I'm really happy to hear that. Part of the book for me was was almost a letter to myself as a as a as a legal student and a young legal professional. So you are the intended audience, and I'm glad that it resonated with you as such. Amazing. So one of the main takeaways from the book is that, and to paraphrase, that the law is a tool to be employed strategically in the service of a political movement. Yes. Where do you think we are in terms of that political movement, especially in light of the recent resistance that we have seen in May 21 and afterwards? Do you think we're close? I, I from, from watching your previous interviews, I get the sense that you think that we were lacking in that respect. And I'd love to hear your views on that. So can I just take a step back and make yeah, sure. audiences that aren't familiar? So as I was saying, this is very much a letter to a younger me and to all the aspiring you know, lawyers in the world. And even now it's really interesting to me that young people come up and say, I want to do what you do, right? I want to, I want to, as it, and, and then are aspire to the law to do that work. And I feel that there's some, something misleading there, right? Because what I've mapped out, right, over this hundred year period between 1917 and 2017 is how the relationship between law and power has shaped the Palestinian struggle for freedom. And the conclusion of it is, is that, you know, international law has been far more advantageous to Israelis, to Israel, to its settler colonial project than it has to Palestinians, notwithstanding the irony of the fact that there are a tremendous number of UN resolutions that support the Palestinian cause, that right there are these refrains that we lean into. The settlements are a war crime and against international law. There's a disproportionate and excessive use of force and so on and so forth, right? Our intuitive reaction 
our intuitive reaction is that international law is this lofty body that is separate from and 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 finally something that can be immune from the balances of power very unjust balance of power whereby world superpower today are are in a unipolar world the united states is the primary ally to israel which is the only nuclear power in the middle east and the 11th most significant military power in the world so many times the pivot and and the desire to lean into the law is to be able to escape these power dynamics right and so as you've highlighted i find as do many critical legal scholars and also all the third world approaches to international law scholars who we, we refer to ourselves uh, self described as twailers that international law in particular was developed in the crucible of imperial expansion in order to facilitate um in, in, imperial conquest it was right who is going to have rights to the sea was it going to be the portuguese or the french this was a struggle over slave trade as well right so this is where international law is developing international law is developing in north america as as conquistadores or or you know conquerors settlers have come onto native lands and are deciding what is the relationship with the natives right and so in, in under papal authority or thinking under the like, christian law and this idea that most most warfare uh, was fought for the service of expanding christ's dominion on earth right one of the things that toilers have highlighted well anthony ingi in particular highlights for us is that although International law at the moment of the encounter with the natives seems to develop a more humanistic face because it says no you can't massacre non-Christians and you can't force them to convert right and this is seen as the enlightenment of law but in fact what it was was a, a, an ability to pummel to plunder and to conquer by other means in that moment that natives were spared massacre because of their lack of christianity their massacre was justified because the spaniards had the uninhibited right to explore in alternative means that the natives have no right to self defense and should they try to defend their lands or themselves they now subject themselves to massacre by virtue of law these are the this is the beginning of international law this is what all other you know iterations of the law are built on it's no different in the case of palestinians it's no different in our case and even though we tend you know many of our narrations of the law tends to be a narration of basically israel violating it or the us not respecting it right this is going back even thinking about and this is where i start my book obviously is thinking about the establishment of the mandate right in the aftermath of the first world war so much of palestinian protest was a protest how the balfour declaration violated the league of nations mandate covenant specifically article 20 which says that you know all mandatory powers have to be in the mandates with the approval of the local population and and article 22 which lays out the mandatory authority which basically declares palestine as provisionally independent and so so much of the protest the petitions the legal you know the lawyering that happens in this period is to say follow the law follow the law follow the right. law follow the law and yet what is missing from that analysis is a critical approach of how these imperial powers were actually reshaping the law in order to create exceptions an exception yes. you know in international law are both i i know i'm not answering your question lara but i just go like keep going <laughs> i'll get there i promise i didn't forget what your question was but that the state of exception right is one that's either theorized as a place of lawlessness there's actually no law just might makes right or it's a place of lawfulness now i didn't lean into the might makes right argument because i think that's too simple I think you know we want to have a very reductionist approach to the world because it helps us understand it it's much easier to be able to explain something that simply yeah they have a they have a tank they have airplanes we're done but that doesn't explain the history of our world and it doesn't explain the history of the palestinians and it doesn't explain the history of weaker populations right of so called lost causes in the language of slavoj jijak who have overcome that condition in order to advance and use the law on our behalf in the moments that i have studied where palestinians have used the law more, most successfully in the service of our freedom struggle it has been in the moment 
where it was used without fidelity to the law. It doesn't matter what Article 20 and Article 22 says in the League of Nations Covenant. It could not matter. It doesn't matter, right? It's precisely in the deliberations, right? Palestinians are, are, have always been brilliant and use, you know, these documents to approach the mandatory authorities, the Permanent Mandates Commission to say, here are all these violations. We're documenting them. The response from the, uh, you know, the man- Permanent Mandate Commission was, you're right, except for the fact that the British have also promised this land as a site of Jewish settlement. And they have these two, you know, competing approaches. And Britain is the mandatory authority. In fact, when the the actual trusteeship over Palestine is established, right, the Balfour Declaration is included verbatim in the preambular text. So far from being just British imperial policy, it actually becomes international law and policy. The Permanent Mandate Commission is not beholden to the British. The Permanent Mandate Commission is beholden to, right, to this international law and policy. When the Palestinians begin to rebel against the British, right, and we see this most vividly and notoriously in the Great Revolt, beginning, right, with with a boycott of British goods, taxes, that leads to an all-out armed insurrection amongst the peasant class, specifically between 1936 and 1939, we see a dramatic shift. Finally, after 20 years of polite protest. It wasn't until then, in 1939, the British reevaluate their Zionist policy, issue the white paper that, you know, scales back and says, no, this will not, this will not be a land of Jewish settlement. There will be some, you know, there will be some limits on Jewish settlement and land sales. There will be a referendum. This should be an Arab state, but it should be, you know, there has to be an agreement between the parties. That was never, that never, you know, manifested, obviously, as we know, because the Second World War started shortly thereafter. Do you want me to answer then the next part of your question? About yes. What we are now? yes, yes, yes. She went off. To have that problem, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Also, like the doctrine of discovery. So the doctrine of discovery is specifically a U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudential doctrine in Johnson versus McIntosh, right? Where the Marshall Court finds that indigenous peoples have, and I think it's the Pinkasha nation, have the right of residency, but not of title, right? They have the right to reside on the land, but they cannot own the land and that the land actually belongs to whichever colonial power discovered it first. Here is- Sound, fam- sound familiar? Sound should, right, when when the Sheikh Jarrah- Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when Sheikh Jarrah was, was, was central in the news yeah. and the Hasbara Israeli you know, machine was trying to frame it as a real estate dispute, what they weren't saying is that what they were offering the Sheikh Jarrah uh, residence was the right of residency, yep. but not the right of title. They could never have title. I mean, this was not just- you know, it's not a colonial echo. It is colonial. Like this is exactly what it is. And these are systems that aren't particular to geographies. I mean, here's where we can see a transgeographic phenomenon, right? Bantu stands are developed in the image of reservations in North, in Canada. The idea of the separate kind of development is developed in the crucible empire in the first world war between Jan Smuts, who's the architect of apartheid, and Woodrow Wilson, the U.S. president who's incorrectly attributed the concept of self-determination and this idea of of, of separate development, but the idea of an Anglo race is superior not merely by birth, but is also superior because they have had a legacy of historical development that has been denied to other brown, black, yellow, red peoples, right? So it was this very rational idea. These ideas are very alive and well. We're not in a post-colonial world. Okay, so you asked me about what does this mean for Palestinians now if they want to use the law for emancipatory purposes? Well, the other periods of where, where law was used, I think, to Palestinian advantage, in addition to the, the moment of the Great Revolt, happened to be the moment of Third World Revolt, when the Palestinians, you know, now the Palestinian militia over the in 1968, they advance into, you know, the UN in 1974 after the October 1973 war, which, you know, sig- radically recalibrated the balance of power across the Middle East. Here's where Palestinians are now working with other, right, with other peoples who are also, you know, trying to become free in what Karman Abulsi, scholar, activist, revolutionary, described as guerrilla diplomacy, right? They weren't there to be polite. They were there 
to basically exercise power. And at that moment, we're exercising an automatic majority within the General Assembly of newly liberated nations, right? Nations that were struggling for their liberation or nations that have been were committed to a third world trajectory, different than what had been set out. It's within this context that Palestinians establish themselves as a, as a juridical people with the right to self-determination, thereby reversing their colonial erasure in the Balfour Declaration. It's where they also establish that they have a right to self-determination that's a, a corrective to Resolution 242, UN Security Council Resolution 242, which reaffirms that juridical erasure when they refer to the Palestinians as a refugee population. Mm-hmm. Not right? even and by not name. people yep. with the right to self-determination. It's also in this period where the Palestinians pass Resolution 3379, declaring Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination by amending, you know, the decade against racism on behalf, you know, that was meant to combat apartheid in particular. It's in this period that the Palestinians also create a right for guerrilla fighters to no longer just be criminal terrorists, but to be recognized as soldiers with the right to fight. 1977 additional protocols one and two to the 1949 Geneva conventions. This was another moment. That's huge. Yeah. That was huge for Palestinians. We don't see after that any other great moments where Palestinians can are using the law to their advantage. We see another moment in 1987 during the Intifada where the Palestinians are in fact changing the balance of power, but rather than use that in order to advance a revolutionary, another revolutionary advancement, that's when they enter into Oslo willingly. And they enter us into our first sovereign, our, our, the sovereignty trap that we continue to be in, whereby, you know, what I, I describe a sovereignty trap as a political arrangement whereby a native population is beholden to their settler sovereign and its imperial patron to, you know, consistently demonstrate eligibility for freedom only in exchange for incremental rights that are never tantamount to to freedom, but instead to some form of autonomy. And so that's where we're at right now. We've had multiple opportunities, especially since the what was known as the second Intifada in early 2000, multiple opportunities to also advance, you know, to use the law to our advantage. We see this at the ICJ, where there's a, in 2004, where there's a decision that basically declares that Israel does not have the right to self-defense on Palestinian lands and, you know, endorses a form of, of boycott. We see this again in 2009 when the Palestinians could have used the Human Rights Council report, also known as the Goldstone or the Commission report that Goldstone oversaw. I know another story, but that Goldstone oversaw that basically found that Israel was guilty of of targeting Palestinians, of reckless targeting of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and actually endorsed weapons sanctions. They endorsed uh, a a convening of South Africa to review the weapons that were sold to Israel. I mean, this was a moment of, of opportunity. We have seen multiple of these moments. We see another moment in 2012 when Palestinians want Palestine to be recognized as a state, but the Palestinian official leadership was so hell bent on being recognized as the state that they defaulted to the general general assembly uh, recognition without using that as an opportunity to highlight U.S. hypocrisy, right? And and mind you, this is a double-edged sword because that recognition is also what provides recognition to Palestinians at the ICC. But I even have critique of our legal strategy at the ICC. Suffice it to say, we have multiple opportunities to use the law to our advantage, but we lack political movement that would guide the deployment of that law. So instead it becomes this erratic, haphazard approach of boing, 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 boing. Where are all these different tactics? What are they targeting? How do each of them, even at even moment of loss, advance a broader strategy? Now, one might say that the strategy is actually intact and that's the strategy of achieving statehood, right? And I think that the Palestinian official leadership is very committed to that. So that they're very committed to rolling out red carpets off of private jets, even if they can't travel without Israeli permission, right? It's it's the performance of the state. So on some level, this quiescence of proving eligibility might be, you know, precisely what the advantage is. I think that, that that's, I, I just think that that's unjustifiable. Even if I, if I don't want to, right? Right? If, if, if for people who don't understand Arabic, even if I'm not going to, you know, hurl profanities 
at the official leadership and I'm as fair to them as possible of what their possible strategy might be, it's still unjustifiable because we have over 25 years of empirical evidence of showing us that that strategy will not work. Now, the other strategy of all out resistance doesn't necessarily, we have no guarantees that it'll work either. It's the strategy that Palestinians have been engaged in and very fervently engaged in between 1968 and 1988. And we saw that that strategy for the Palestinians brought them to the, you know, to, to the feet of Oslo, where they entered into this sovereignty trap. And, and it was only in Oslo that they were able to, you know, actually achieve the return of Palestinians to Palestinian lands. So I do understand that argument, but it doesn't mean that that is the end of our horizon. And it doesn't mean that now that we do have a diplomatic edge, which we should take advantage of, that we no longer also resist. The PLO historically, according to Paul Chamberlain, did much of what the Vietnamese did, which was uh, fight while talking. They should be fighting and talking at the same time. Instead, we've been so committed right? The leadership, Mm -hmm. not us, but the official leadership has been so committed to just talking and proving politeness, right? That we're now in a place where Israelis can all out say that, you know, deny the Nekbe, right? Or say they'll, they'll bring a second one. They'll bring, they're, they're fine with that, that can use the language of genocide and we're, are not held to account that can frame BDS as somehow anti-Semitic that can frame these legal strategies as legal terrorism, you know, terrorism by other means or or lawfare, right? We have so shrunk in the realm of actually resisting that we've only created greater grounds for Israel to attack us. And we saw that vividly in the assassination of Shirin Abu Akleh last week, and then the attack on her funeral. And the pallbearer is carrying her body. We created that space. We created a space where Israel does not suffer any consequences. When I was, I used, I worked as, you know, specifically in human rights advocacy for many years before I went back to school and entered the academy. So I was vexed by these questions. And one of my assignments on behalf of the Badil Resource Center for Refugee and Residency Rights, as well as the Coalition of Palestinian Human Rights Organizations, was to lobby the permanent missions at the UN in New York to adopt and implement the recommendations of the Goldstone Report. I got meetings even with Security Council, nation, you know, member state, France and Britain. In both of those meetings, and I'm sure a lot of this was lip service because they wouldn't want to do it, but the Palestinian Authority is providing them cover. But in both of those meetings, they said we would be really willing to explore these recommendations, but the Palestinian leadership doesn't want this. The Palestinian leadership basically used the Goldstone Report findings to get better negotiating terms with the Israelis, right? And so you can't have member states as untrustworthy as they need, but you cannot have member states that are doing more on behalf of Palestine and Palestinians than the Palestinian Authority. This is the condition we find ourselves in. So whatever we're doing with the law now is fine. It's Maybe it's scaffolding. Maybe, you know, I think it's best used as a defense mechanism. But I do not think, you know, one of the risks of using the law, you know, to advance any particular strategy is that it's going to take up more space than a political strategy. It's precisely what the problem became that people have with BDS. The human rights discourse became so large and overwhelming that it actually obscured a political cause, right? Palestine became merely a human rights cause. But human rights are depoliticized. And so that became the critique became about BDS. But in fact, the critique should have always been about the lack of a political strategy. It was just that those human rights norms took up a disproportionate amount of space when there, when there wasn't a political strategy that it was, was servicing. And so that's the same risk we take now, right? And it's precisely why settlers are using that same human rights language to say that they have the right to be on that land. Right? How do you combat that? Human rights versus human rights. Politics. You change the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. 
One of the phenomena that you describe in the book is how Israel manages to create new law, which negatively impacts Palestinians through its repeated violations of international law. So in other words, there seems to be this formula, which is that a state's violations of international law, plus the lack of accountability, equals new bad law that entrenches the violation of Palestinian human rights. And I think unless you're a lawyer or a specialist, most people are probably not aware of this phenomenon and aware of this disastrous additional consequence of Israeli impunity. And this reminded me of what you said about how it doesn't really matter what the law is, it just matters what you do. And everybody knows that if, you know, if you're a good lawyer, if your case is good on the fact, you argue facts. If your case is good on the law, you argue the law. Right. And it's always the combination of the two and the tension of the two that, you know, you use to try to bring out the best parts of your case. Can you speak a little bit about this phenomenon and and how, you know, it's not only about the initial violation itself, but that it paves the way for an atmosphere, which is more sinister. And what do we do to combat that when impunity is what reigns? There is this notion of, okay, if we just publicly shame and publicly expose them, and maybe that's part of the answer. But when impunity reigns, what is, you know, what are we working with? What can we do? So I, I, I heard several questions there. Let me, let me try to answer all of them. One is to say that on what do we do and what do we do with impunity reigns, right? This is the silver bullet question. Hmm. What's going to work? We're working on all these levels. There's the media level. There's the legal level. There's the protest level, right? We don't really have, you know, there's somewhat of a political level. There's the academic and knowledge production level. There's the cultural realm. Like everybody is trying everything. We want to do everything. My good Social I've media. <laughs> yeah. I've tried most of them, right? right. I'm a co-founder of the DC Palestinian Film and Arts Festival. Like I'm committed to the arts as doing this. I've written plays. I've, you know, I, I, I do media. I've lawyered. I'm teaching. Like I've, I'm, a, I'm an activist. I've done the UN. I get it. I get it. Like we need to figure out what I've even done lobbying. I worked in Congress in pursuit of what is it? Do I have to, you know, we have to be kinder to one another, right? That just because not a single one of these strategies, and in fact, none of them all together right now, right? But especially not a single one of these strategies is necessarily the silver bullet. No single, no single approach is going to get us free. We have to accept that. Right. And get I get so frustrated with the naysayers who have everything bad to say about everything being done as if there was a perfect way to do anything in the first place. It's like, you know, we're not idiots. <laughs> Nobody thought. Right. That if, if, if we did this interview, if we recorded this podcast. Sure. <laughs> we free we're, the land. we're freeing Palestine. Right. right. Free land. My goodness. We didn't free a centimeter of the land. But that's not. Right. That's not what we, we've learned from history about how, how freedom and social movements work. You work. You work. Circumstances that are unexpected come together at moments that we can't even predict that will, will, will create an opportunity for us to push. We need to be prepared to push. We need to be prepared to, for the resistance, to properly resist. We also need to be prepared to build. So all the time that's being spent right now on radical imagination, right? I I have this wonderful anthology of books called Palestine 100. I think it's, what is it? Besmal Ghaliani, who, who, um, I I know you're looking, I can't look, my bookshelf is not here, (laughs) that, that, you know, edited that book. But even this radical imagination, all of that is about, you know, what's next, this this architectural project that's led by doc- Dr. Salman Abu Sittet being studied by soon to be Dr. Nur Juda on how you rebuild these villages. All of all of this is in the production of our freedom. We have to be prepared. That is what we have to do. So there is no silver bullet. Now, what about when it comes to the law? So specifically on the changing of law, I was referring International law has, according to Article 38C of the ICJ statute, four sources. One is treaty law, which is basically international contracts that you know are observed through explicit consent. Another is customary law, which is the combination of what states do, state practice, and what states believe is legal. And then there's you know general principles, which are gap fillers. And then there's also you know the ideas of, of jurists that you know also help to inform jurists and and jurisprudence. So just specifically thinking about treaty law and customary law, I'm talking about treaty law has to be an explicit consent. You actually have to recreate treaties. You have to create new law. Security Council resolutions are law. 
treaties are law. So the apartheid convention is a law. The convention for the elimination of racial discrimination is that treaty law. Thinking about the additional protocols, the Geneva Convention, those are all treaty law. Customary law is different. Customary law is not written. There is no explicit consent. It's you know uh, it's observed through um, implicit consent, right? And that in particular is what you can change through violation, because it's what states do. And what states believe is legal. That's how we saw, for example, that assassinations, which were, you know, historically declared illegal, right? Very explicitly since the early 1980s under the Reagan administration and the rest of the world now begins to transform in the early 2000s when Israel begins to extrajudicially assassinate political and military Palestinian leaders without, you know, any kind of due process and on Palestinian land. And and the U.S. initially begins to protest this practice as assassination and extrajudicial execution. And then we see the U.S. adopt the practice as well Mm -hmm. in their global war on terror. And with time, the U.S., together with Israel, reframe assassinations into what they call targeted killings. They neuter the term. They create ways that you engage in targeted killings. They even create this idea that it's cleaner right? And more humane than, you know, more blanket warfare. But in, in fact, it's precisely the extrajudicial executions that mark the lives of Palestinians. We saw protests to this practice very fervently under the Bush administration, but we saw that protest wane almost into disappear under the, once the Obama administration took it up as a primary policy. So what we see is that these two powerful states very explicitly they 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 own it right they say that they did it they say that we changed the law in order to make it acceptable and here's how their violations can become new law because now we see the more and more states that pick it up it's not legal but it's also not explicitly illegal it becomes you know in this realm of dispute and if it's disputed there's no accountability there's just talk And so here's where we see new law being created. There's no way to counter that but fervent protest. There really is no way. And Palestinians aren't the only ones that are subject to executions. You know, in my work, I draw parallels. I think what, you know, I think the killings of, of Black people, transgender people, children, men, women in the United States is extrajudicial execution as well. And so the more that we we also take up this language, acknowledge this is not just police brutality. These are colonial practices. This is ex- this is this is a colonial geography. We not only draw those par- parallels, but we also increase the possibility of of protest together. Given the nature of customary international law and how it evolves, does it not seem then that this is a total recipe for disaster because there is no universal centralized enforcement body to enforce international law? So it seems like it's almost inevitable that human rights protections are going to wane with time. Okay. So the, wait, the first part of that is that customary law will change. M- my question is because there is no universal centralized body that enforces international I law. You. I see what you mean. Isn't it then almost inevitable that customary international law is going to evolve so that it will essentially weaken and and and, and human rights protections mm. are going to wane with time. It seems like it's almost inevitable, right? Because all it requires then is for somebody to violate the law in order to create new law. Two things. One is this, this condition isn't particular to customary law because there's other treaty law, right? There's like, as I mentioned, on, on racism for women, the rights of the child, right? Against torture. There's all these, this treaty law that doesn't evolve over time. But it's much more difficult to get treaties passed, right? And to get treaties. Right. And yet, and yet, even though it's much more difficult, but that's what I'm saying. Even if it doesn't change, those protections are also waning. Right. It's not because of the nature. It's not because of its dynamic nature. It's because of the political will. So even though, right. So torture is not only treaty law. It's not only customary law. It's not only, right. It's not only use Cosian's law, like along with slavery, the prohibition along with slavery and genocide, that you can do nothing to make it legal. We saw the Bush administration basically call it enhanced interrogation techniques. So the law remained intact. They agreed torture is illegal. But they said, we're not doing that. These are enhanced interrogation techniques. So it doesn't, what I'm trying to say is that 
we should not worry about the law so much right. or its content. They argued the facts. They said we're doing something different. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Oh my God. I would love to keep this going for like oh, this is a in, long time. This is so great. <laughs> you are. I didn't think you were talking about this. So I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm coming out coding a little bit. You're a wealth of knowledge. Can I get your reaction to something really quickly? <laughs> yeah. On tape. What are we doing? Yeah. I read your paper, racism, whiteness, and burnout in anti-racism movements. Uh, very exhaustive read. Hard to get through. <laughs> I took a couple breaks. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I died. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was waiting for the question. Oh, there's no question. Was it's just, question? I, I oh, talk it sometimes. Joke? Yeah. I just tell jokes sometimes on the podcast. Sorry. Thanks, Michael. That's hilarious. Yeah. I tell yeah. jokes too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're funny. Jokes. Yeah. How do you find Will Smith in the snow? Look for the oh prince, God. fresh prince. <laughs> yes. You look for his fresh prince. Very yeah. good. Very yeah. good. Okay. I think Will Smith <laughs> okay. should have hit him with a backhand because that's a tennis move, you know, and then he would have been authentic to character. Wow. <laughs> wow. All right. I want to ask you a question about your recent research about Zionism. You recently delivered, I believe, a lecture at one of your visiting professorships about the history of Zionism and in yes. particular history of the UN the resolution. Of the drafting resolution. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The that drafting codifies, the resolution. Exactly. That codifies that Zionism is a form of racism. And we know that eventually this was taken off the books. It's no longer the case. By the Palestinians. I know. <laughs> One of their many, many concessions. I personally think that it is essential for Palestinians to be challenging Zionism and that that needs to be central and foundational to our liberation struggle. Indeed. I wonder if you agree with this. If so, why? Uh, if not, why not? Oh, no, I agree with you a thousand percent. Right. I think that, you know, so the resolution 3379 comes at the, in the aftermath of 1975. Throughout that summer, Palestinians are basically trying to get endorsement from all of these regional meetings that are happening, the International uh, Conference of Women in Mexico City, the Organization of African, Un the African Union or African States in Kampala, Uganda, the Peru, you know, Lima, Peru, it was the non-aligned movement, so on and so forth. And what they wanted was really to unseat Israel from the UN General Assembly, just as the General Assembly had unseated South apartheid South Africa in 1974 under the leadership of Abdel Aziz Bouteflika as president. They failed. They failed to achieve that endorsement because Egypt opposed the move, because Egypt was deep in negotiations to recoup the Sinai in diplomatic negotiations. And so instead, all of these different regional meetings declared Zionism as a form of racism without hesitation. The Organization of African States even says the cause of Palestine is an African cause. Zionism is a threat to world peace. I mean, this is the language that was used. So when they returned to the General Assembly in 75, in the fall of 75, now knowing that they, they had lost that battle, they go to the third committee where this decade against racism is being negotiated to declare apartheid, you know, to combat racism all over the world. They want to amend the entire resolution to insert the word Zionism everywhere, everywhere the words racism, apartheid, colonialism appear, right? So this wasn't like a standalone. This was part of this broader movement what I what I do in this drafting history is that it was actually very contentious. It was very contentious. There were and 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 a lot of the contention, there was full support for the Palestinian cause, but a lot of contention about what exactly is racism? What is Zionism? Right? Because according to the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, there is no definition of racism. There isn't even a definition of race. The convention only defines racial discrimination. And it defines racial discrimination as those privileges or distinctions that are made between race, color, nationality, descent, ethnicity. But if you look at that, if race is distinct from color and distinct from nationality, ethnicity, and descent, then what is race? That never gets defined. Now, that ambiguity is mobilized during the procedural history in order to, you know, basically combat, no, Zionism can't be racism, but we also get very lucid racial theories. I think the most advanced ones are obviously by, by Palestinian thinkers, including Faiz Sayyid, Hassan Saab, and others who are basically developing a theory of, of Zionism as a form of racial elimination and not merely racial domination, and are drawing on the text of Zionist thinkers to say, we never call Jews a race. 
Zionists called Jews a race. Now, what's really complicated and why this is such a flashpoint during this time is because the other framework that racializes Jews are anti-Semites and anti-Semitism. So this is really, really contentious. And Hassan Saab, in fact, says that, you know, in his 1965 article, that the irony of all ironies is that Zionism is being, you know, develops and grows out of the same political and intellectual geography as anti-Semitism, right, as well as Nazism. They don't call it Nazism, but this is what happens. Nadia Abul Hajj later theorizes this as well, which is to say that Jews, in fact, did create themselves as a race in the course of, of its Zionist policies, but upon establishing Israel, then erases that they were ever a race, right? The, the, the race piece disappears. Why is this relevant, y'all? Because all of these apartheid reports that have been coming out have refused to grapple with racial theory. He says there's apartheid without racism. It's Jewish, it's religious and national supremacy, right? Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International say very specifically, no, there are racial groups. Jews are a racial group. Palestinians are a racial group. But nobody's doing the theoretical work. And that's what I'm trying to do now with, with, a, with a colleague of mine, John Reynolds, we're trying to do some of this work, which already gets us. I mean, I, you, I can't breathe um, or talk about this or even just even share the history of it without being attacked. People, it's hard for us to have this discussion. Now, what we want to get to, what we want to get to is to be able to highlight that we're not only concerned with the state and how it reforms itself, right? This is not just about, you know, de jure amendments to the law, the same way that the U.S., for example, ended Jim Crow, but has maintained white supremacy. We're concerned not only with legal reforms, we actually want to decolonize. And that means Zionism has no place. Zionism has no place. Now, we also need to be able to do this with, with, with some nuance, Right. Because Zionism, there is a spiritual form of Zionism that means something to people. I don't, I don't, that's none of my business, what it means to you, you know, spiritually, that's, or, you know, that Jews define themselves as a people. Also, all peoples are imagined. If Jews define themselves as a people, I'm not also going to say, no, you're just a religion, you're not a people. But I can say, once that, you know, self-conception, or once that spiritual connection, you know, is tantamount to, you know, and predicated on the erasure of an entire Palestinian people, that's absolutely unacceptable. The one other thing I want to say about Zionism that I think is really important for people to think about, and this was offered by Fayez Sayyid, is that it has three primary pillars. One is that it is, is driven to, to racial segregation. It literally wants to segregate Jews, Zion, you know, Zionist Jews. It wants to segregate in in a, a Jewish state. It wants to segregate even within communities because Palestinians are ghettoized and they can't live together. The second is that they're driven by by racial purity. That they're also not promoting mixture connected to the principle of of segregation, right? Um, and the third is is that these two things together are leading to you know, a form of supremacy. And so there's, there's a way we can talk about this when we start to like break this apart and not just say these are two racial groups and there's discrimination. But when we begin to, to break it apart, how did Zionism actually in its desire, I want, I, I'll, you know, in its desire to emancipate Jews actually internalize anti-Semitic principles that it then reproduces. The idea of purity, segregation, and superiority are actually internalizing these kinds of conceptions. And, and worse, it's all in order to be able to aspire to whiteness and to in inclusion within a Europe that excluded them completely. Zionism isn't an indigenous movement, as you know, Hasbara artists want to tell us, isn't about return of anybody, also as Hesper artists, if it was, there would have been a respect for the land. There would have been a respect for the people on that land as conduits of how you belong there. there yeah, they would. They wouldn't spray it with skunk water every every other day. Skunk water, or or desecrating, you know, olive trees, or rejecting everything native about the region. Ben Gurion said explicitly, Israel is part of the Middle East in geography only. Literally, it is a satellite state. How can it both be 
a satellite state and place of, of you know, I, I, I even accept this idea that indigeneity can't be both, which is why I completely and wholeheartedly support Jews can belong on this land. We all belong on this land, but it doesn't belong to you. All right. That's a great place to I would stop. Say- I know you got to go. <laughs> Really ahead, quickly, Michael, I ahead, would just say ahead. Jews can absolutely belong on the land. Zionists cannot. I, I, this thing about Zionists cannot, you know, there are something something known as cultural Zionists, right? Here's the thing. Spirit- we don't, at, at least here, we don't define Zionism by anything other than its actions. And so you can talk about like scholarly cultural Zionism in the halls of a history department or whatever. But when it comes to bulldozing people's houses, you can't tell a little girl who just got her house demolished. Hey, I'm a cultural Zionist. It doesn't, you know, this isn't even my thing. Well, I would think that cultural Zionists are actually, yeah, you know, it is, it is very difficult for us. They've left no room. There's no chance to rehabilitate this. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there was a a historical moment. Actually, I'm doing all this reading about the cultural Zionists who, for example, insisted that everything be translated from Arabic into Hebrew and Hebrew into Arabic, for example. I mean, there's just, there's so much potential in history lost, but you're right. Why are we doing more work than they're doing for us? You're right. hundred percent. We thank you so much. And we absolutely have to have you on another time. So please let I us know who you would that. like. And I just want to be, you know, Lara, I, I am a fan. I admire your work and your persistence and everything that you've done. And I've been wanting to do this interview because of you. So oh my God. I, hope, I hope that I have, I've done. I'm going to like jump off my balcony justice. now because you're like, this is what I want to say to you. <laughs> yeah. But I just want you to know, like, I, I, I see you. I admire you. Thank you. you. I'm, I'm thank you for everything that you do for us. And I really wanted to do this to honor your time and everything you do for us. So thank you, Michael. Thank you. I don't know you as well, but I'm no, I figured, I figured it would get to me eventually. Right. I figured <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the one that brought you in actually. So it makes sense. Yeah. I hope to get, I hope to, get to know you and, and to be able to say some other things about you. I'm sure. Likewise. And thank you so much. Okay. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. I know. Good, good luck. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Folks, that has been another episode of the Palestine Pod. Thank you all so much for listening. Go ahead and check out our episodes at www.palestinepod.com. Check us out on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. Send us an email at palestinepod at gmail.com and find us on Patreon, www.patreon.com slash Palestine Pod. Thank you all so much for listening. That has been another episode of the Palestine Pod. Hope you all have a great day. Do-do-do-do.